Hey everyone, it's Ken Rakowski. Welcome to Metal Connect. Each week we share time with one of the speakers that were with us on a Saturday metal. We dive deep into what they're doing, the way they think, the businesses they're working on. This is an opportunity for you to ask them deep, deep questions. Naveen Jen is joining us this week and Naveen has an incredible, incredible past, a total disruptor in every sense of the term. Uh, the word no is never in his way. He knows how to get around it and make things happen. He is a can-do type of guy, and he, in most cases, is years ahead of the trend, which is really important. I'm honored and happy to have him join us tonight. Naveen, thank you very much. Where are you located right now? Are you in Seattle? Ken, I'm actually uh, in Bellevue, Washington, yes. In Bellevue. I still live in Bellevue. So tell me, yeah. is, is that part of the United States still considered a great place to be an entrepreneur? I tell you what, I think every place in the world is a great place to be an entrepreneur. I mean, that's just a fact, right? In the times we live in today, everyone around the world, whether you live in some place in Africa or you live in India, or you live in China, every one of us has access to the same set of technology, access to the same group of bright people, because we can actually, and the end, same amount of capital because capital is no longer patriotic. Capital flows where the opportunities are. So to me, yes, Seattle is a great place to be an entrepreneur and so is Delhi and so is pick a place you want in Cape Town in Africa. Every place is a great place to be an entrepreneur. And if you wanna make a difference in someone's life, there is no better way to be doing it than to be an entrepreneur. So stop calling yourself a philanthropist. The only people who call themselves philanthropists is people who have passed their life past their uh, actually people who more or less have actually nothing more to contribute to life. Because to me, the best way to contribute to the humanity is to pick a problem that helps a billion people live a better life and go out and solve it. That's a true philanthropy in my opinion. Yeah, that whole billion person solution is a very singularity approach. And it's, it's, it's tough to achieve. I mean, it's, it's a great BHAG, but to mm -hmm. achieve that, what happens if you don't even come close to it? Did you at least achieve something? Well, that's the interesting thing about thing is when you, so first thing you have to ask yourself, I think Ken on last Saturday, we talked about it. God forbid you are successful in doing what you're doing. Does it have a potential to help a billion people live a better life? Now, once you know the problem is big enough and you know it has a potential to get there, and even if you don't take the things across the finish line, you move the humanity forward enough that somebody is going to come along, take the baton, stand on your shoulder and take it across the finish line. And irrespective of who does it, humanity still benefits. So you don't have to be the person who actually goes and takes it across the finish line and get everyone to clap for you. The fact is you move the ball forward. That is where the entrepreneurs clap for themselves. Okay. I want to go back to our very first statement about being anywhere you could be an entrepreneur, okay? Yeah. Do you believe everybody has an entrepreneur DNA inside them, or do you think it takes a unique person to be an entrepreneur? I think every one of us has that, and simply is about the mindset. So it's not in our DNA that about whether you're born to be an entrepreneur or not. It is in our mindset whether you will get to be an entrepreneur or not. And the mindset of scarcity is what, what gets people to not do it. It's the mindset of abundance that allows people to say, not only it is possible, just because 100 other people are doing it doesn't mean I don't, I can't do it anymore. The point is, it is abundant in a sense that problems are so massive, there could be 1,000 people working on it and it's still not enough. Yeah, but it's kind of like being an athlete. We all could be an athlete, but being a good athlete is different. You have to train, you have to work hard. So being an entrepreneur is a general term. Being a good or great entrepreneur takes a lot of work. Agreed, but it doesn't take a good genes is what I was trying to say was, it does take a lot of hard work. It takes every ounce of your waking hour. It takes the true, um, true obsession to solve the problem. And unless you have that obsession, you can never be a great entrepreneur. You have to go to bed thinking about solving the problem. You have to jump out of the bed wanting to solve the problem. And the best way to know whether you're working on something that is actually worth doing or not is really simple. When you wake up in the morning, 
if you ever spend five more minutes in the bed, then whatever you're working on, you something you should quit and find something that actually excites you enough to jump out of the bed. How much has COVID changed entrepreneurship or business, do you feel? Uh, an answer is every single, every single thing that happens actually creates a new set of opportunities that never existed before. And I would tell you that COVID, and I'm not, I'm not trying to minimize the COVID, the number of people whose lives have changed, the number of people who have died, and you know, all that stuff breaks my heart. But having said that, go, nothing could have been better for the healthcare industry and consumers than COVID. And here is why. It advanced the healthcare at least by 10 years, right? Because it, healthcare companies like Kaiser of so the world would have never done telehealth for another decade. The consumerization of healthcare and the fact I can tell you, it used to be very simple. I do what I do, I get sick, I go to the hospital, it is someone else takes care of me. COVID has changed that. COVID has said, you know what? I don't want to be sick. I don't want to go to the hospital. What can I do to stay healthy? How do I build my own immune system? Can What actions I take have consequences? And that has fundamentally changed everything. That means consumers are realizing their actions have consequences on their health. That means what they eat, what they do, where they go, everything impacts who they are and what their health is. To me, that is the best thing that could have happened. That means now we're dealing with the person who believes that they can be the CEO of their own health. They have a power to control whether they get sick or not. And that never existed before. Yeah, it's, it's going to be like drinking from a fire hose with Naveen being with us, okay? You're going to get so much knowledge and information. Make sure you get your questions on in the chat. So put them in there if you have a question for Naveen, because I don't want you to miss this unique opportunity to share knowledge with him. Okay, back to this idea of, it sounds like we need as humans discomfort to find opportunity. We need to be uncomfortable to find opportunity. Do you agree? Well, so I would just simply say is that you have to have a problem before you can solve it, right? So if you are simply saying, I have a solution, I'm looking for a problem, that is like, you know, saying, okay, I think everybody should want this. The fact is what you're saying is that every time there is a problem, every time there is a darkness, every time there is something bad, that is a problem that needs solving. And that's what creates an opportunity. So every time someone says, why didn't someone do something about it? Right there, there is an opportunity. Every time someone says, do you know the billion people are suffering from this? Right there, there is an opportunity. Okay, let's, let's take it to a different level. Let's look at some of the startups. Then we had Yahoo, and then we have Google, and then we have Bing. We have a whole bunch of ones in between, AltaVista, Dogpile, Sherlock, there's tons of them. Where were the life problems? Wasn't Yahoo good enough? Wasn't uh, Google good enough? Did Bing really need to be created? An answer is to, like, you know, there are sev some industries where winner takes it all. In other industries, actually, you can have multiple solutions catered to different group of people who actually need a slightly different modified thing. So you could Yahoo cater to the people who really needed it in the beginning. If you remember Yahoo, it was simply organized content, simply who wanted to know what are my books, what are the things I need to do. It was very well organized thing, just similar to if you guys are not too old to remember Magellan, right? I mean, those were all very different part of the world. And then there were people who say, you know, type in a keyword. And guess what happened? We learned not what information we need. No longer we need to know the answers. We learned what keywords I need to remember to get the answer I want, right? So my point is, it's not that every time the Yahoo was bad, Yahoo was catered to a certain group of people. As people advanced more and more, there was a different need. And as more and more content came about, Yahoo's useless, Yahoo became less and less informative because it couldn't keep up with all the new content that was going on. So it needed to be automated. And then as people start to do the automation, if you remember, you know, Alta Vista was really good, but guess what? When Inktomi came about, they fundamentally changed the way Alta Vista worked. But Inktomi was really, really good. But what Google did was fundamentally very interesting. They said, how do we find the content is really has authority? And they literally, this idea of a page rank, 
was that our, if somebody that has authority is talking about you, then you transfer that authority to that. As you and I see in our world, right? The person yeah, you let's, associate let's, with. Let's be fair. Google did not make that. Google bought that. Uh, let's, okay, fine. I mean, well, actually, no, Google, Google Google's bought AdSense. No, 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 no. I, I think, Ken, you're wrong on the history on that. Google bought AdSense, which is different than uh, actual underlying Google search engine. I'm not talking about the advertisement, the feed, ad, the, sorry, the, the display ads and stuff. That's the AdSense that they bought, right? But underlying algorithm of Google was actually done by Larry Page and uh, uh, Sergey, and actually the guy named, what's his name? Oh, guy who did the beam. I mean, God, help me out here. Uh, Scott. So Scott wrote the original crawler for Google, right? So Scott wrote the crawler. Larry actually had this idea of page rank, which is essentially like you said, the company you keep is the authority that gives you. So if you surround yourself with 10 people who, who are just great, everyone thinks they're great, guess what? By association, you become great. And that was a really interesting concept applied to the search engine. And that was the key to their success. And I can tell you all about the thing that deal with Yahoo and it's going to interview me all that out, right? But fact was they really did that. And here's what happened. As more and more people started using Google, they created this flywheel. And I'm going to come back and as we go along, we still have plenty of time. I want to explain this concept of a flywheel because to me, every entrepreneur, once they understand the concept of flywheel, everything changes, right? And okay. the idea is that as your thousand one customer, are they actually getting better experience than your thousand customer? If the answer is no, then you actually have not created a flywheel. That means every customer that you acquire, does it make everyone in the system better? And what Google that was, it started to learn from what people were typing. It started to learn what people were clicking on. And that made them so much better. The pain point of people not finding on Google just went away. And what that meant was, it's not that Bing could be substantially better. Let's assume hypothetically that Bing is technically better, but it's the point is when I, as a user go to Google, I don't say, God damn it, I wish someone actually did it better. It's never that. It's always like, eh, I got it, I, I got what I needed. Yeah, sure, the Bing may be technically better, but it there is not a problem that needs solving here. So now, yeah, so somebody had a better solution looking for a problem. And it wasn't a problem because the solution was good enough. That's exactly my point. That's it. Okay, CK, I noticed that you have a, like a smile on your face. I know you're enjoying this, but you have a series of questions. Go for it, CK. You got two questions for you, Naveen. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Number one, uh, you are such a joyous person. You're such an uh, energized person. I'm smiling because I'm getting some of that enthusiasm from you directly, right? Through osmosis here. So the question is, well, how are you cultivating your joyful life? That's the first question. Second question, you also have mentioned about don't focus on uh, net worth, focus on self-worth. So similar question, how do you cultivate uh, your, your own self-worth, your, mm -hmm. own, your own faith in your own ability? Two questions. Uh, so let me answer the both the questions first. Since I remember the last one is always that you know when I get you get to my age you will know why you always take the last one first because you remember it. <laughs> uh, so you know in some sense uh, cultivating the inner happiness. First thing you have to always realize is the happiness comes from within. We all spend all of our life looking for something or someone to bring us that happiness, right? And once we realize that that's what we are doing, what, guess what's happening? We are giving the remote control of our happiness to someone that says, happy CK, unhappy CK, right? You decide whether you're happy or unhappy. But once you find that happiness inside you, you could be in a dark corner and you could be happy. But if you are unhappy inside, you could be in a paradise and still be unhappy, right? So to me, what I realized very early in my life was every day when you wake up, God gives you a choice. Do you want to be happy or unhappy? And if you say, I want to be unhappy, you can think of 10 reasons why your life absolutely sucks and you need to be unhappy. God, you know, I am going out on flying on a Learjet. My life really sucks because look at Larry Page got 747 and Bill got 650 and this guy is flying on Global Express. My life sucks. Right? I got this God. 50 foot yacht and look at, you know, Charles Simone got a 400 foot yacht. My life just sucks, right? The point is you can find hundred reasons to be unhappy. 
If you say I want to be happy, guess what? You wake up in the morning and you say, oh my God, my joints don't hurt. God, what an amazing life I live. I just woke up next to the person I just love. My life is amazing, right? I am working on things that actually I enjoy. My life is amazing. And once you develop that and you start to feel that you fall in love with who you are as a person. And I really think if I could just expand it just a little bit more on that seeking, then I'm hopefully I'll still remember the first question is <laughs> the day you fall in love with yourself is the day the world will fall in love with you. And I don't mean to be self-conceited. All I mean is never looking for someone else's approval for who you are. You've got to be so comfortable who you are that you don't need someone else to tell you who you are, right? Not, don't let someone else define you. The other thing that I found really interesting is that when we as an individual find ourselves at any spot, people always I know, end up asking, you know, if you look back in your life, what is one thing you could change? What would you change, right? And my answer is absolutely nothing, zilch, zero, because here's why. Because if you change anything, mistake you made, the things you did, that would take you down a totally different trajectory of who you become. And if you love who you are today, why would you want to change anything behind you? Because everything that happened to you is what made you who you are today. So fall in love with just who you are. Now, I actually forgot the first question. So what was the first question? <laughs> uh, your yeah. net worth versus your self-worth. Yeah, and I yep. think that's really the, uh, thank you for Ken. God, you must be really young to remember that. I'm your age, actually. No way. I'm old. But born, go ahead. Born, which date? Let's go do that comparison. No, I'm 1966. You're a few years older than me. Few? God, your fuse are really, I am 50s, 59 to be precise. Yeah, we're five <laughs> years different. That's it. It's five year difference. Seven, dude. Let's do I'm an Indian. I do math on the fly. Oh, you're I 66. thought you said you're I thought you mean you're 59 years old. My bad. No, 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 no. 19. Born in 59. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seven. Got it. Yeah. Uh, Actually, Naveen, uh, it's your energy level. You're so energetic. What what are your rituals to 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 be so I mean, other than being appreciative, be grateful? What are you doing to maintain your physical machinery to be so energized? So first of all, CK, you asked a really, really, what I would say, dumb question. You can uh -huh. never, <laughs> Thank you, you. Can <laughs> never, you can never become like someone else by following their habit, right? So in okay. a sense that you become like them by following the way they think, not the way they behave. So like, okay. as I say, Tony Robbins takes an ice bath. You can take an ice bath three times a day. You're not going to become Tony Robbins, right? You sure. become Tony Robbins by thinking like Tony, not by behaving like Tony, right? So the answer is none of the things I can tell you that I do, and you can follow every single thing, it's not going to make you. Right? So the mindset really is about, and it's not, I mean, seriously, I mean, I'm dead serious. The mindset about is that everything is actually possible. The re only thing that is not possible is the one that you believe is not possible and something that you cannot describe in vivid details that because you can't imagine it clearly. So imagination has to be so clear that you can close your eyes and describe the each detail of it. If you can get to that point to describe the world in that vivid details, you know that world can be created because you now know what is possible, right? <laughs> So to me, coming back to the net worth and self-worth is a lot of the times people define their success by the amount of money they have in the bank. But to me, if you were to look at success should be defined as number of lives you're able to, able to improve or number of people whose life is better because of you, that is the true definition of success. And one, only one way of knowing actually is when you become successful, right? How do you know you actually become successful is the day you become humble is the day you become successful because humility tells you that you no longer have to prove anything to anyone. If you still have iota of arrogance left in you, that means you're still trying to prove something to yourself or someone else. That is not success. Success is not about going out to a restaurant and saying, do you know who I am? If you have to tell someone, do you know who I am? You're really nobody. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. CK, thank you. Let's go. I'm going to go over to uh, Rick. Rick, you are next. Go for it. Unmute yourself, Rick. 
Yeah, um, I was just going to ask, what are the essential ingredients for cultivating entrepreneur skills and how do you enhance the entrepreneurship uh, in your teams? And actually, after writing that, uh, it reminded me of a book uh, by John Doerr, mm -hmm. uh, Measure What Matters uh, and OKRs. I don't know what, 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 what do you use to, um, to actually operationalize entrepreneurship? So obviously, you know, look, John Doerr and OKRs are really, really good for hiring a, for a great COO. So if you want to be a great COO, absolutely focus on the damn OKRs and they are really good for operational person. But if you really want to create the company, it's not about operation. It is clearly about knowing your North Star. It's clearly knowing about why you wake up in the morning. It's every day, single day you think about where, where do I want to be and how am I going to go from here to there? So you need to have a massive amount of vision and a North Star. And then you start executing it very small slice at a time. So you don't have to boil the ocean, but you need to know this is what the ocean looks like. Then I'm going to take a piece of it and I'm going to keep solving the problem. And the way I go about that is to say, okay, as opposed to saying this can't be done or this is too difficult to be done, what I ask is what needs to happen for this to be done? So for example, we say we need to live on Venus. Great. Now, as opposed to saying oh, it, can, it can never happen, we say, okay, what technologies need to be developed for us to be able to live on Venus? We say, well, we need to be able to leave the Earth atmosphere. Well, that's called the rocket, check mark, done. Oh, well, we need to be able to travel from here to there. But we know how to do that check mark, done. We need to be able to land on the things. We know how to do that, done. Now, next question, how, how are we going to grow the food on the moon? Terribly dumb question. The question needs to be asked is why we eat food, not how to grow the food, right? So my point is you start to go break it down into a smaller chunk and say, what needs to be done? And then you say, this is the problem that is not done. Let me work on fixing that problem and then we can live on the means, right? So my point is you can start to take every problem and apply as an entrepreneur, the framework. I think, Ken, I might, I don't remember again, I'm too, too old to remember they discuss this framework of an entrepreneurship called why this, why now, why me? And I'm happy to uh, discuss it again if that, I, I don't remember if we discussed it. You are welcome to, but before you do that, take a drink of water. <laughs> actually, I don't have, actually, I do have water. What? <laughs> ah, I was thinking what well, maybe I just. Let's do that. Let All right, here we go. Now, a quick follow up. You know, the, the, the thing is, though, um, is that when people are unconsciously competent, um, they, they can't necessarily, uh, you know, break things down a way that other people can follow in the method that you developed. I, I was wondering whether you've actually, um, you know, documented your way, so to speak. Well, so kind of yes and no. So I did write a book called Moonshots, Creating a World of Abundance, right? And that breaks through about how do you look at a problem in a completely different way that allows you to solve that problem, right? And this framework that I'm about to tell you is really the one way of doing it, right? So first question before you start any company, ask yourself, why this? That means, why do I want to solve this problem? And there are a couple, of, a couple of ways to look at this stuff. You say, God forbid, I am actually successful in solving this problem. Would it help 10 million people, 100 million people, billion people live better life? If the answer to that is no, that means, you know, why would you want to spend a decade of your life solving something that just doesn't even move the needle? That means market is just not big enough for you to spend that, you know, 10 years of your life doing it, right? Second thing is, why now? That means what had changed in the last couple of years that allows you to solve this problem today versus a problem that was there a decade ago? Because point is, COVID happened. It created a set of opportunities that didn't exist pre-COVID. Now, same type of things you start to say, you know, now if you want to solve like I'm doing with Wyoming healthcare thing, right, is to solve this, the cost of sequencing to digitize the human body, the cost of sequencing has to come down, right? Is it really on exponential curve down? So just to give you an idea, when I started, the cost was $2,000. And I thought if we can bring that cost down in a couple of years to $100, this problem actually would become solvable. We sit here today, 
the cost is $10. So even though I thought I was really optimistic, I was actually 10x pessimistic about what the cost was going to be. The second was the cost of processing this massive data would have required a supercomputers. And I thought, you know, that problem should get solved as AWS start to bring the cost down. Now, cost of processing the data when we started was $40. Today, I spent $1.50 on it, right? So my point was everything we was very clear that they were on an exponential curve down to make it happen. And the third part was, once you have all the data, how do you want to decipher it by using powerful AI? And it was pretty clear that AI was going to get so powerful that it won't even require as much data as used to require, and you'll be able to understand what's causing people to be sick. And that was the key, that we saw the confluence of technology, not just one, but the confluence of technology that allowed it to be possible. And the last part, uh, Rick, just to answer your question, this is the key, why me? That means what question are you asking that is different from what everyone else in the industry is asking? And that is the key to entrepreneurial success because it's not about having the answer. Every entrepreneur believes that they have to have the right answers. I believe the right answers can come from 100 experts out there. Your job is to ask the right question because the question you ask is the problem you solve. And in our case, while everyone understood that the gut microbiome may be key to human health, everyone was asking the same question. I want to know what organisms are in your gut. And I said, no, that's the wrong question. The question you should be asking is, what are they actually producing that is causing a disease, not who they are? And just that question allowed us to actually look at a totally different technology that allows us to actually do that today then would have been possible if you were asking exactly the same question. So to me, the last part of why me is very simple. Are you willing to die for it? And if you're willing to die for it, then you should live for it. And that is the key to knowing, are you really, really care enough about solving this problem? Rick, does that answer your question or it didn't? It, it would answer everyone's question. <laughs> you are not a man of a few words whatsoever. Please then put in again your questions. I'm trying to go to you, Simon, but your camera is off. By the way, I need your cameras on if you're gonna ask a question. Turn your camera on. Simon, Leslie, turn your camera on, please. And I'll let you dive there. You are uh, the beautiful Simon Leslie. Simon, go for it. What is your question? I've just had to put a shirt on and switch the light on just so I could get involved. Hello, hey. Kenneth. Hello, What's Naveen. Going? How are so you? I'm, gonna start, I'm gonna start off with a moan. Mm. Right. It's, a, it's, a, it's a moan before I ask the question. So Naveen, in, in 2018, I bought two sets of Viomes, one for me and one for my son who had chronic fatigue at the time. And I never got either results back shipped internationally. So there's my moan. Um, my, my, quest, my question to you is, what is your greatest learning from 2020, sir? I think we started with that. I think uh, when we talked about the COVID, that how COVID has actually uh, helped the healthcare industry move 10 years ahead. My other learning from COVID has been that, you know, the world is a small place. It doesn't matter where you are. You can actually be now together and build a company from across the world in different parts of the world. That means no longer you have to have a talent sitting right next to you in your city. You can have a talent anywhere in the world and you can use that talent to create a company that you want. The idea of a virtual company used to be that only, you know, the people, two people in a garage that create a virtual company. And if you want a real company, you have an office and you have a sign on that and you have multi-story building. That was the only way to do that. Now we are realizing that the idea of having a massive company where people now talking, whether it's a Microsoft or Google or Facebook, that you don't have to come to office anymore. That's a totally new concept and creating a virtual world where the access to talent and talk about having a visa and all that because you can't come to this country and work. Now you can be anywhere. It doesn't really matter. I want your, per I want your own personal learning. That's something that's happened to you personally this year. Uh, my best learning is that, you know, uh, two of our kids, I started our, uh, their own company and kicking ass. So my oldest son was, <laughs> had two companies and I started the third company that is around creating a, how people rent their stuff, a new way of credit card that you can pay your rent on. And my daughter just started her own company on women's health. 
So she bought uh, one graduate from Wharton, one from Stanford. My third youngest one just graduated from uh, this, uh, after graduating from Stanford, he went to, to become a Schwarzman scholar. He just graduated and started his own company. So 2020 has been an amazing year for us. And I look at my success is very simply how well our children contribute to the society is my contribution to the society. Wow, so you, uh, use, your children, you use your children as a metric is what you're saying. I'm sorry, I, can I continue? You use your children as a metric to judge your own performance. Uh, I judge my performance as a parent to see that it's not just us leaving the better world for our children. It's also about leaving the better children for the world, because if you're not really uh, getting your children to start thinking about that, they need to measure their success in the right way. You don't want them to become a parasite on humanity. So coming back to the, you know, the question that I think uh, CK was asking, when our children were young, when we told them that your self-worth will never come from what you own, your self-worth will come from what you create. That means you can own a lot, but you haven't created anything. You're still a parasite on humanity. So never be a parasite. Never think just because you have it, you have achieved anything. You haven't achieved a shit. You haven't, your self-worth is still zero if you haven't created anything because your only thing you have done is owned it. What do you think, Simon? Was that Beautiful. Okay, I, I want to go a little deep. Simon, thank you so much for putting a shirt on. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know what? I think you kind of opened up a can of worms just now by oh, saying God. you said, don't you think in some ways governments allow people to be um, feeding off society, not contributing, but more or less taking? How do you change an environment where governments are almost creating exactly the opposite of what you've said success is? I'm going to take a deep breath and you always think that I can sometime I can be speechless and this is one of the few times I'm just taking a deep breath and not going in the political down no, <laughs> political I, I, I got to tell you Naveen, you know I I find it fascinating when I go to countries like Korea and Israel yeah. and I notice something I don't see I don't see yeah. the the idea of entitlements jumping up where where a younger generation says I deserve I want I and they show a different type of image. Yeah. It's almost as if they're part of the collective to make a change. Yeah. So and then, me, and then, I'm not going to answer your question, but I'm going to deflect the question by answering a different question that you could have asked or should have asked me. Okay. So, uh, which is really about a lot of the times what we want and what we incent are very different things. So, right. So, for example, uh, you go to Middle East. And they always, I mean, they every time you're going to go to Dubai, you're going to, you know, everyone says, we want to create the culture of entrepreneurship in our part of the world. And this is really the big thing we want to do. And I was talking to a lot of the people who actually could do that. And I said, really, is that what you want? And they said, yes. And I said, I can tell you really simply, would you consider taking down the poster of Amir from every Gardam Square and put a picture of a, every successful entrepreneur in every corner, guess what? Every single person will say, I want to be like that. Next, I'm going to start a company. I want to be like that, right? Because they know they can't be a me, but they know if you can start promoting the entrepreneurship and make them the heroes, every person will walk by, every mother will say, son, look at that. You can be like that tomorrow, right? So my point is what people want and what they incent are very different. So to answer your question, what government wants and what government's incents are completely different thing. What they're trying to say is, look, we all in life sometimes have tough circumstances and we think we want to be able to get people off that into the road to recovery. And I think as we, I remember talking last time with you that life of an entrepreneur is like a heartbeat. It goes up and down and up and down. When your life is smooth, you're dead. So any one of you who's living this smooth life, you're living a dead life, a life of a zombie, right? The life needs to be this heartbeat, up and down and up and down. When you are down, just remember, hunker down because you know the next beat is going to be up. And when you, when you are on top of that beat, Never get too cocky. Just remember the winter is coming and winter shall come, right? Let, let, so let, the, 
let me ask a question with your win. I love your little winter is coming uh, scenario. Um, let's go to your let's go to your home country being India. Let's go look at Modi. You know, Modi's got the BGP, he's got insane support around his own government and the people. He has an epidemic where it looks like India might eventually actually overtop the United States when it comes to COVID cases. So incredible discomfort for India. Do you think that this situation will make India better or do you think it will bring it back in time? Now, first of all, uh, you know, if you look at India even taking over United States, that is really, in fact, a great outcome. If that really, if that's all just happened, then we slightly overtake United States. Remember, the population is no, over COVID four cases. times. Yeah, right, right, right. So four times more population in one third less area. That means that literally, you know, 50 million people living in a small area like Bombay. And where you're living in these places where there's literally nowhere you can walk, there are not a thousand people, and you have lit less cases than US in such a high, bigger land, that tells you that whatever that is happening is actually much better than could have happened, right? Yeah, but there's, there's very little testing. I mean, you and I both know that. That's one of the no, biggest problems. I agree, but my, I'm not talking about the cases, I'm talking about the death. The point is, Definitely. you can hide the cases, or you can't hide death for too long. And my point I'm gonna make is what is really interesting is in the slums where people are living in literally on top of each other, 20 people in a room, even there, there have been the number of deaths have been so minimal. I mean, there is no death that's minimal, but my point is relatively the people have not died. And the reason for that really is to some extent is they're not very hygienic in a sense. They already been probably infected with everything that's out there. And they probably got some antibodies from something else. And they're saying that Corona thing being there, seeing that worst thing, seeing that this is nothing. I immune system says I can deal with this thing in my sleep. <laughs> that's an interesting observation because you know, as well as I know, uh, I spent a lot of time in Mumbai and, um, exercise is not something that is practiced in India. It's for some reason, they rather take naps than work out. I mean, I blew my mind seeing that. Actually, so, they take, they'd rather take a pill than work out. So you yeah, can yeah, give them yeah. any pill you want, they'll pop in that pill. But, but exercise is a problem. And obesity is really starting to run rapid through a, a place like India. That's where you can make a, a, a affect a billion people very easily mm -hmm. is in a place like India. But that's so, what I'm doing. I mean, if you look at what Wyoming is doing, I mean, that's literally what we're doing to understand how do we get rid of metabolic disease like obesity, diabetes, heart diseases, looking at things like cancer. So today we can diagnose oral cancer, stage zero and stage one oral cancer with 94% accuracy. 97% of the people who actually do our test and follow recommendation, they get, they 97% get better within three months, right? 77% of our people, in fact, follow the recommendations we give them. That is unbelievable, the difference we are making. We, I mean, just in such a short period of time, Ken, we have already helped 250,000 people live better life, right? And my thinking is we're just barely bigger. And I'm hoping that, you know, with the community like yours, we will spread this magic, we will spread the word to millions of people who could literally take control of their own health and stay healthier. All right, Paul, go for it. I'm a huge Biome fan. Neil uh, Neil Cannon got me on Biome a few months ago, and I'm yeah. already on round two of my retest. Um, how do you think the quarantine is actually making our immune systems weaker by not being exposed to all these bugs? Yeah, you look, know, immune system is really interesting. So the immune system, if you think about it, is uh, activated by very different things, right? So part is just uh, environment that we live in. So you're constantly breathing the, you know, uh, whether you, and if you take a walk in the nature, you're breathing billions and billions of uh, microbes and you're exhaling microbes, right? So the fact is when you are living in an indoor environment, it doesn't mean the microbes go away because as long as the air is circulating, you're constantly getting influx of microbes, right? To some extent, uh, you are now exposed to the same group of people constantly. So that means there is, is some amount of uh, what I would say cross, uh, cross 
pollination of microbes from one person to another person, right? Uh, but in general, I agree with you that the more we are able to be outside, the better we are for our immune system because to some extent you are now exposed to the cow dung and the chicken shit and you know the horse thing and nature. So the point is the more you're able to be out there and be one with the environment, the better your immune system will be because we were designed as a human being to be living in this microbial world where all we were part of one ecosystem. You know, we somehow the self and them, we, you and I are not separate. I mean, if you think about it, you and I look like, a, I mean, I'm just going to go totally tangent, can just uh, let me indulge for two minutes here, right? We think we are this solid body. The fact is we know there is nothing called solid, right? Everything is made of atoms. Atoms are made of, you know, <clears throat> neutrons and electrons are made of quarks and they're made of all energy. So at the end of the day, there is simply the floating energy around all of us and we're just floating energy. Our system, the brain and the eyes and our sensors make it look like there is one holistic thing. Our uh, haptic sensors in our touch makes you feel like I'm touching something. There is nothing but simple energy, right? And that's why I believe we are all connected, the microbes, the universe, everything we live, we are all part of one big universe and everything that happens inside us impacts the universe. Everything that we do to the universe impacts us. So we have to really think about, as Ken said, we are one collective energy everything that happens has a ripple effect on everything else. We can no longer disconnect ourselves with what's happening in China. What happened in Wuhan impacts us in uh, Kansas City, right? Powerful. Let's, more, Teddy, I'm gonna go to you. Teddy, you got it. Hey Naveen, uh, hey, Teddy. love what you do. Love my biome test. I stopped eating spinach because of it. Um, I, I'm probably due for another one. Um, my question, and you, you mentioned earlier about like markets and timing and how important timing is important. Um, this question is about, about 5G and, and the wireless future that, that we are going to inevitably continue to go towards. And, um, and I read, and this could be a conspiracy, but I read the more metals you have in your body, the more you're picking up those radio waves. And, and being Viome does blood tests and stuff like that. Are, are you aware of any of those things being real, being a trend? Are you testing for metals? And, and are you, do you have any ways? Um, yeah, are you concerned about that, I guess? So um, first of all, thank you for being a Viome customer, Teddy. Uh, second thing is, uh, you know, if you look at, we measure every gene expression. That means anything that changes anything, it changes the expression. We look at every mitochondrial genes, the human genes, the microbial genes. We are looking at now, obviously in the uh, gut, but we're also adding the things to the oral microbiome to the test, right? So point is we look at everything that's happening in the body and what is causing that to change and why you are having certain diseases. And then we give you the food and the food supplements as a way to intervene and to be able to prevent and reverse whatever disease you have. Now, in general, a lot of these you know, things have some iota of a truth, but then they go out and make a whole big deal, right? You know, EMF is going to kill all of us. For heaven's sake, I mean, it's like saying, go back to the olden days when there is no electricity. The fact you have electrical wire, you have a 60 hertz constantly fluctuating all around us. So it's not your cell phones. Oh my God, cell phones are going to kill us. Electricity is going to kill us. Everything you can go back and say, look, anything electronic should not be at home. Any Anything out there you should be living in a cave because the fact is if you're living in a urban jungle there are thousands of things that your body wasn't designed to do but guess what right at some point in life we say you know the technology has advanced far enough along that we don't have to live inside the cave we don't have to go on hunt our own food we can actually go to the supermarket and find the food for ourselves right so my point is uh, we can now, I will not only understand the human biology, we are able to intervene. And I absolutely believe that within a decade, we will get rid of cancer, we will get rid of chronic diseases, we will get rid of many of the current way of people thinking that once you get old, you have to be fragile. I really think not only we're going to increase our lifespan, but more importantly, we're going to increase our health span and that is going to be the key it doesn't matter how long we live 
every day of our life, we're going to stay healthy. And that is going to be the, to me, the best benefit that humanity can drive from what, you know, what every one of us should be doing, which is living healthy. Yeah. All right. Another sip of water, Dean. <laughs> okay. Come on, hydrate, hydrate. We're running into the final, final round of this. Final round. Let's go and do some, some, some serious questions now. Okay. okay. <clears throat> How do you stay in the positive side of investors if you're an entrepreneur that has had the propensity of having some businesses that have failed? but you know you're coming up with the next big thing. How do you stay in favor of investors moving forward, knowing the failures that you've had? Failures never, failures, just because your idea does not succeed, doesn't mean you fail. Every idea that does not succeed is simply a stepping stone to a different idea and a bigger idea. In fact, that's the beauty of an entrepreneur. Just because you are, you're, past idea did not succeed, it simply tells you now you are much closer to having another great idea. And I think as Edison said, it wasn't the thousand times he failed, he figured out a thousand different things that don't work to make the light bulb. And that's how we figured out what actually works, right? So point is, entrepreneurs only fail when they give up. Everything else is simply a pivot. Got it. And then is it necessary to be liked by everyone? Oh God, it is really, really easy to be liked by everyone. You do nothing, you be nothing, and you stand for nothing. And if you can do that, you can be a doormat, everyone will like you. The fact, if you stand for anything, there are people who are gonna hate you. If you do anything, there are people who are gonna hate you. If you, you know, anything you want to do in life, you, you people are gonna hate you. So point is, yes, if you want to be liked, just do nothing, you know. <laughs> Okay, now let's talk about the flywheel. I think I talked about flywheel without talking about that. The concept of flywheel really is that as every single customer that you are acquiring, are your next customer better off than your customer just before that? So if you have a thousand customer, when your thousand first customer buys the product, are they buying exactly the same thing what the thousand customer bought or the benefit they're driving from it is substantially higher. So if you are selling the water bottle, guess what happened? Your thousand first customer gets exactly the same product that your thousand customer got. When you are a, say for example, a Wyom customer, the fact that Teddy and uh, uh, who else was a customer, the fact they use the service, we learned from them that makes the next person's results better than the, uh, anyone else, right? And guess what now? Everyone makes everyone before them better. Everyone makes everything after them better. And this literally the concept of fly, fly me. So what happens is when we start, we say based on these 250,000 people, I see, can you did the test, you have inflammation. And I really think in the past, knowing this kind of inflammation, the curcumin should work really well for you. We gave you curcumin. Guess what? We did the test again and said, hmm, that did not work. We say, okay, Ken, the curcumin didn't work for you. So I'm gonna now give you elderberry. And guess what? It worked. Now we learn what was the things that actually caused curcumin not to work for Ken, but elderberry does. And now we find, hundred other customers who had exactly the same problem with the curcumin didn't work, but the elderberry did. Now we are able to identify in what cases this does not work, curcumin doesn't work, but the elderberry does. Now we make that a population level knowledge. So it starts with population goes to N of one and from N of one, it becomes population. And that's literally how you create a flywheel. And now here's what interesting thing is, as Ken continues to do tests every three months, every six months, guess what? After five years, I know everything about you that now you can go to any other company. They don't know all the different things that didn't work for you. They're gonna start all over again. And now I have created the thing where you are, I am more valuable to you than it doesn't matter where you go. It may be cheaper, better, faster, but you can't leave because how much knowledge I have about you. And that is another end of one flywheel. I've now created the flywheel for you that you can't leave me. So Costco's flywheel is the more members it has, the buying power becomes stronger, the prices go down, the inventory gets much more niche for the customer. So the more, the, the more they have in customers, 
the better they serve the masses of customers. That is one part of the thing, but what they don't do is to make every customer experience better. What would be really, really nice would be that if they could learn from every, like every time I buy something, they know exactly what I'm buying and what else I might need and literally create when I go to Costco.com, a Costco just for me. They say, Naveen, you bought this and you actually are going to like this because every customer who bought this also like this. And I'm what going Amazon to try it. What Amazon right? does. What Amazon does, right? So my point is Amazon has really developed a more personal relationship. Every time Amazon recommends a book, I actually buy it and I like it. So if this is a great reset with COVID and these companies that we see that we're riding high are now on the bottom, let's take an airline, for example. They should be able to reset to follow your flywheel pattern. So if you look at like a United or a, an American Airlines, how can they apply the flywheel methodology to be better on this re-emergence of who they are? Well, so the first of all is, you know, the airlines, uh, and I'm just taking, I'm going to answer your question, but I just want to rent for a while. The airlines, the problem they are, they find themselves is forget the COVID for a second. They forgot why they exist in business. They actually thought they are in the business of squeezing the customer to make the most money rather than delighting their customer. There was never someone said, oh my God, I love flying. There used to be times, if you remember Ken, 20 years ago, people used to say, oh my God, I love flying. People got great food. People were served great. I mean, everything experience was so good. Now it has become such a big hassle, right? So to me, if you look at United, where they treat a customer, where the customer is a burden on them. And the reason partly is their employees hate the company. So when they hate the company, they hate themselves and they hate their customers, right? I mean, that to me is the fundamental problem is, you know, and the interesting thing is that if you travel first class on international, guess what? You know who is your person who is serving you? The person who has the biggest seniority, people who is most jaded, people who have no interest in actually serving you. And if you, God forbid, you can say, ma'am, would you give me a glass of water? She looks at you and says, I'm here for your safety, sir. It's like, oh my God, really? <laughs> my Ooh. point is, that is the fundamental problem they have to solve is delight the customer, meet the customer where the customer is. And if you do that, when you go through as a company tough time, your customers actually support you. I mean, there are so many local businesses I can tell you like in New York, when people shut down, they say, look as a business is a pizza place. Look, we can't afford to stay open anymore. And they put the GoFundMe, the people put $100,000, go stay open here because I'm gonna come back and eat pizza, right? My point is because they were delighting their customers and customers want to make sure they don't get shut down, right? If yeah. airlines, God, I would rather have them shut down because there's hopefully somebody better will come along. It's so the true. only airlines that you and I ever enjoyed probably traveling would have been a Virgin, uh, Virgin America. I mean, that was the first time that airlines actually you had fun flying, right? Uh, you know, so anyway, my point is that's one thing that Richard does really, really well. He takes the uh, takes an industry where customers are just not delighted and actually builds a service that delights the people, whether it is a cruise, whether it's a hotel, whether it's a, you know, you look at airlines, you mean you look at the, uh, in the resorts. I mean, if you ever stay at any of the Virgin properties, you know, you're going to be treated well. You're going to have the more... Uh, probably some of the best uh, staff that will- You're absolutely that. right. Let's, let's talk about also this new corporate environment. You know, we, we've always knew the top down type of business environment, the CXOs on the top, working with that, that team that's almost like a pyramid. Now we're seeing this lateral corporate environment. What's your thought on that? You're an old school guy. I know you started this way. You're seeing this, this almost flat corporate environment. Are you satisfied with this? Is this gonna work or are we looking at just an iteration of what's next? I think it's the iteration of what's next because at the some point of time, there has to be a decision making. We know for sure that you cannot make a decision by consensus. A committee made decision is probably the worst possible decision. Why do you think uh, how our Senate and House works, right? You never get a best answer, you get a compromise answer because you're trying to satisfy everyone rather than actually what's best for the country, right? So to me, what I, what I do normally is a 
kind of a hybrid structure. That means in my, uh, in our company, we let everyone have an opinion, but that's where it stops. We hear everyone out and then we make a decision and then we see that's the decision. We're not looking for say, how many people vote for this? How many people vote for that? That is not how we build it. It's democracy in business. It, yeah, but in that, but I do want to hear the people's opinion. So even my executive team, I would say, look, I want to tell me, tell me what we should do here. And then I hear everyone and say, now, here is what I now having heard everywhere. This is what we think we should do. And here is why. Now tell me, what am I missing? What part have I not thought about in this decision making that I think I missed? And if you can convince me that I'm wrong, I will change my mind. If not, from now on, there is no discussion. There is no more. I told you so. That means we commit here and then it's everyone's idea and we're going to go out and execute. Curtis, go for it. Hey, Naveen. How are you, man? Good, man. Good. How are you? Good. Uh, we all know companies deal with challenges. So yep. I'm just curious, what challenge are you currently dealing with right now? Yeah. And then also maybe one that you just overcame. Right. But, you know, I can, every single day, you can find something. The problem is none of these are really challenges. It looks like a challenge when you're dealing with it. And most of the time I have this, my Eastern philosophy. So I ask two questions of myself, right? 10 years from now, would I still be looking at this problem and saying, oh my God, how this was the biggest problem in my life? Answer to most of the question is, eh, no, not really. So he lost a customer, that's where the big customer, I'm saying, you know, five years from now, I'm gonna look back and say, eh, whatever, right? Point is none of the shit really matters, right? So I look at the stuff is, what's the worst that can happen? If this outcome, let's assume, does not fall your way, what's the worst that will happen? And if you can live with that, and my answer to that is, eh, then in that case, let's just go move forward, whatever it is, right? So to me, here is a very simple thing. I follow my philosophy of work and life. If it is out of my control, I just don't worry about it. That means I have nothing to do with it. There's nothing I can do about it. I don't worry about it. And if the things are in my control, I never worry about it because I know I'm doing the best I can possibly do. And there's nothing else I can do. So it is what it is. It will be what will be because I'm going to do the absolute possible best with the information I have, and that's all I can do. And at that point, it will be what will be. Gotcha. So your business, was it your original intention? Because sometimes when challenges do arise in business, we pivot. And that pivot, we think could be a bad thing and actually can turn into something better. So was that your original vision and was any challenges that came up that just kind of put it on a different trajectory, maybe in a worse way, bad way, a better way? So Curtis, I can give you a whole bunch of examples which will actually be make no sense. But the fact is we never changed our North Star. So in a sense that we knew we want to focus on preventing and reversing chronic diseases, right? Now, would that, would the RNA sequencing was the first thing we did? Yes, we did. But in between, we thought there would be other things that we could add that could actually help us. But turned out they were actually the wrong set of technologies. Guess what? We got rid of them. And sure, could, could we, did we lose a couple of million dollars? Yeah, sure. But you know what? In a big picture, we never miss the sight of why we are doing it. Every single time we ask the same question, if we do this, would it help us prevent and reverse chronic disease? Every single time questions we ask every time, whatever we do, how would it take us closer to our goal of preventing and reversing chronic diseases? That's it. And everybody in the company asks the same question. Why are we doing it? Is it going to get us closer to our goal or moving away farther from our goal? That's it. All right. So how do we set up a special metal discount? How do we do this? Very simple, brother. So I would send you a link with a code of metal and everyone who is here or anyone in your community who wants to buy it, um, I would make sure that everybody gets 10% off. How about that? I like that. And last question. You mentioned Game of Thrones by saying winter is coming. Oh God, you, you were the only one who got that one. I don't think we anyone got, got that. We all got it. Is there any shows that you've actually binge watched? Oh my God, I, I have to admit, I, you know, I, 
watched a Game of Thrones. I watched Homeland. I mean, you you got to watch. I mean, you got to binge watch that. And I love Tom Hopper. By the way, at Game of Thrones, Tom Hopper is one of our Wyom customer. He loves Wyom. He has, his child is autistic, and he says nothing that helped his child get better than what Wyom did. So he is now, by the way, part of this Umbrella Academy. So every time, I mean, he, you know, he's my he's my guy. I love it. Hey guys, I just want to remind you first, Naveen, thank you so much. I hope to see you in the community more. Tomorrow on our investment show, I actually have Henrik Fisker joining us. He's going public on Friday. He's joining us tomorrow to really talk about the whole Fisker IPO. You don't want to miss that. Naveen, thank you so much for joining thank us. You, Unmute yourself and thank Naveen. Thank Come on. Thank you, guys. Thank you, man. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.